This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, I'm here with yet another case of an intumescent cataract in a 65-year-old lady and uh, the central antechamber depth is just 2 mm, 2.14 and uh, the capsule is extremely tense and we can see the chamber is, there is iridocorneal contact in the peripheral part of the antechamber. So again, the challenge typically will be how do we do rexis in such eyes. So let's see how things go in this patient, you know. Patient is slightly sensitive to pain, so I'm just uh, giving a small dose of uh, post-receptinous anesthesia. I'm giving 1 ml of uh, lignocaine in the post-receptinous space that should make her more comfortable. I'm starting my surgery by making these paracentesis uh, incisions and the capsule is stained. The chamber is deepened by using dispersive OVD. The main wound incision is created and I'm beginning my surgery with the capsule excess forceps. Uh, as soon as I grasp the flap and try to tear it, I can suddenly feel the extreme uh, desire of the capsule to run peripheral. So immediately I just keep it flap and then pull it sent repeatedly. The pull-in technique I'm trying to do it and you can see that the rexus is coming back but with a lot of reluctance. So the key in this situation is never to fold the capsule. Use the tearing method of doing rexus rather than shearing. The moment we fold it is going to run out. So what I did when we see in the replay is that when I'm trying to enlarge the tear, I am keeping the capsule flat and then pulling it momentarily so that you can get the control. Although it doesn't seem to be very much in control, but you can see that the capsule is prevented from running away. So this is completed by using this same tearing technique. As we close it, there's a lot of lens matter which has aggressed out into the antechamber. And now before I enlarge the capsule, it's mandatory that I decompress the bag. So in this case, I have decided to do the decompression with my phaco probe itself. So I'm going to go in with my phaco probe and with a second instrument and just try to aspirate the uh, overlying cortex epinucleus and also some of the epinucleus and cortex which is behind the nucleus. Uh, the second instrument which I'm using is a Sinsky hook which is used to just tap the nucleus and just rotate it a little bit so that the underlying epinucleus and cortex is loosened up and just comes out. It's important for us to decompress the bag from the posterior aspect of the nucleus as well. And by tapping and tilting at the nucleus using the second instrument, uh, the, uh, the loose epinucleus in the cortex which is behind the nucleus can be released and then aspirated out through the phaco probe. So that's the idea here. And once I'm convinced that the intracapsular pressure has been decreased significantly, I come out, OVD is injected and then I need to enlarge the rexus here. Now using a micro scissors, I'm giving a tangential cut and then the rexus is enlarged. So now I have a decent sized opening of about 5 mm which should be adequate enough and it's very well central as well. So now I begin the nucleus management. Uh, surprisingly the nucleus seems to be quite uh, bulky and dense. So before doing the direct chop I want to just create a sort of a trench so that I can bury my phaco tip into the heart of the nucleus. So I'm just creating this a small trench so that I can bury well. Uh, we can notice that when I'm trying to trench I usually support the nucleus with my second instrument uh, so that the trenching becomes very effortless and the nucleus stabilization does help in getting a better purchase when we move the phaco tip in each stroke. So once I have an adequate depth, and that's the time I decide that I'm going to. The settings are changed to the chop mode. You can see that only longitudinal energy is being used now. The tip is buried into the substance of the nucleus and then I'm using the vertical chop technique wherein the chopper goes down vertically and then the lateral separation movement happens here. 
So I am aware that the, the posterior plate cracking has not occurred in the subincisional part of the nucleus but I don't want to stress it more. Uh, this is good enough for me. I can take care of it uh, as the nucleus is rotated and it can be dealt with at later time. So important principle for me is to not induce a lot of stress while uh, fracturing these lenses. So I'm doing a vertical chop in such eyes where there is no epinucleus cushion and the uh, the nucleus is very hard. Uh, the trick I to ensure that I don't put stress on the zonules or the bag is that I just lift up the nucleus so that the nucleus is touching the anti-capsule and then the chopper moves down vertically and then laterally. By this uh, movement, if you're careful, there's no stress is put on the capsule bag. So that is important for me. So you can see that, you know, the nucleus is relatively hard but not very hard. Uh, in a couple of strokes, you can just divide the nucleus. Now the second important point I want you to observe here is that the tip which I'm using uh, this is a 45 degrees balance tip which is exclusive with only with the Alcon machines which have the torsional energy and because it's a very thin tip it becomes difficult for us to get a good grip uh, because the size of the tip itself is very small here. So to minimize the disengagement of the tip when you're trying to laterally separate I usually turn it sideways. In this case, you can see that the bevel is facing towards my right. And when I'm trying to laterally separate, this ensures that the, the whatever the purchase which is there in the nuclear fragment is maintained and the tip does not get dislodged. So this is one uh, way of uh, trying to ensure that the disengagement of the tip does not happen while using such small tips with the 45 degrees bevel angle so now i have got around six pieces now time to uh, emulsify them so when trying to emulsify these quadrants again i use a side on orientation of the bevel in this case i uh, usually i prefer to during quadrant removal i just prefer to have the bevel oriented sideways towards my left side i think it the reason for using a sideways bevel is that you're having a higher chance of the bevel being exposed to the nuclear fragment so that energy is being used much more efficiently you can capture larger part of the nucleus and also i feel that apart from increasing the efficiency the followability of the nuclear fragment is also great by using a sideways so i prefer to use sideways when i'm quadrant removal i always prefer to use it to the left side so this is how i personally try to do this this sideways orientation might not work with uh, other tips and other machines because the tips will be designed differently. Now the reason why I use this is specifically for this particular tip. This is a 45 degrees tip and we have got an extremely slanted bevel here. So that's the reason why I choose this so that this is the position I feel wherein we've got maximum exposure of the tip and a greater chance to get occluded with the nuclear fragment. The plane of emulsification is extremely important. I try to be conscious of the fact that I don't come anterior or above the pupillary plane. The second instrument also plays a great role in maintaining this and you can see the nuclear fragment now is just rotating in the bag. So part of it has to be within the bag when I'm trying to emulsify. This ensures a minimal trauma to the corneal endothelium. The last fragment is aspirated out and uh, uh, usually, you will not be surprised that one tiny fragment it will always be uh, sticking at the side port entry. I always try to keep a note of it and then remove it immediately. So the nucleus management was done and now is the time to deal with the cortex. The cortex is aspirated out quite easily. A time to place in the intraocular lens. I'm using the hydro implantation technique to implant the intraocular lens here. The irrigation is introduced to the side port and the BSS itself is going to maintain the capsular bag and the edit chamber. So I'm using a single piece hydrophobic lens here. The lens is gently manured into the bag. Some of the visco which is there uh, sticking out of the lens is just 
irrigated out and that's it the case is done the side ports are hydrated again when i'm trying to hydrate the wound i ensure that it is the cannula is placed in the much anterior stroma and directed anteriorly and i again recheck the pressure uh, that's it the case is done thank you for watching and hope this helps